This is a walkthrough of an A-level further mathematics core pure paper, paper two. Question one, part A, we need to do is find this integral one over x squared plus six x plus 25. Now in core, when you get an integral like this, it's not gonna be partial fractions. What you need to do is to complete the square on the bottom. And actually, if you did try and factorise this, you're going to get complex roots, so that's not going to work. So we have x plus 3, half of the 6x, all squared. This is going to generate a 9, which we don't want, but we need to add on a 25, which we do want. And so that will give us 1 over x plus 3, all squared, minus 9 plus 25 is 16. Now, hopefully at this point, you'll recognize this from the result, which is if you want to integrate 1 over a squared plus x squared with respect to x, that is 1 over a arctan x over a. And I believe this result is in the formula book, but it's something that you may remember anyway. We want this to look exactly like that. So this is like the a part a squared so a is going to be 4 and then I need to use a substitution so I'll say let u equal to x plus 3 then if I differentiate that du over dx is 1 which means that du is equal to dx so that's the substitution I'm going to use so that will give me integrating 1 over and I'm going to write it exactly like this, even have the things the same way around. 4 squared plus u squared du. And then I can just apply the result. 1 over 4 arc tan u over 4 plus c. And I just substitute back the u for x plus 3. And I'll have a quarter arc tan x plus 3 over 4 plus c. Okay, so that's our part A done. Part B is asking us to find the exact value of this integral here. Now, I notice that this part here is literally like the same as part A, but times 25. So I can use the result from part A to help me integrate this. So let's do that. So the first thing I'm going to do in part B is write it as 25 times part A. So I'll have 1 minus 25 times a quarter. Um, sorry, not a quarter. I don't want to put the integral yet. Uh, times uh, 1 over x squared plus 6x uh, plus 25. That all needs to be integrated. Now, I can then use the result from part A to do this part here. So I can literally just take that result. The only thing I really need to integrate is the 1. That's going to be easy enough. So over to the left-hand side now. and work this out. So integrating, I will get x minus... 25 lots of what I've got here, so 25 over 4 arc tan x plus 3 over 4 and limits of negative 3 and 1. So let's put those limits in and see what we get. Start with a 1. So I'll we'll have 1 minus 25 over 4 arc tan. And then if I put the 1 in here, 1 plus 3 is 4, 4 over 4 is 1, so just arc tan 1. And then I'm minus, and we'll put the minus 3 in. So I'll now I have negative 3 minus 25 over 4 arc tan. And this time, when I replace x with negative 3, all of this bracket here becomes 0. So arctan 0. Right, let's work that out and see what we get. So, so from the first bracket here, I will get 1. And then minus 
25 over 4 times by arc time 1, which is pi over 4. So that will give me 25 over 16 pi. And then minus from the second bracket, negative 3. And arc tan 0 is 0. So putting that all together, keeping it um, exact, I will get 1 minus negative 3, which is 4. And then minus 25 over 16 pi. Part C. State with a reason whether or not the student is correct. What are they correct about? Should read this first. A student claims that the magnitude of the answer to part B is the total area bounded by the curve uh, y equals 1 minus the 25 over x squared plus 6x plus 25 and the x-axis between the line x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. And now read the question. State with a reason whether or not the student is correct. Now remember, uh, we need to check whether this graph crosses the axis could be because part of the area could be below the axis. That's what we need to check for. Now what I'm going to do is basically check the y values of this uh, function here. So I'm going to say let f of x equal that function or this integral here. And then I'm going to work out f of 1 and f of negative 3, the two ends, and check for their signs, check for their values. Okay, so let's work that out. I'll put 25 there. I think I put 1 before. So f of 1 gives you 7 over 32. And f of negative 3 gives you negative 9 over 16. Okay, so since f of x changes sign, that means that the graph crosses the axis or crosses the x-axis. And I finish it off the rest of the conclusion here. So it crosses the x-axis, therefore part of the area is below the x-axis given a negative area, so the student is incorrect. You'd need to work out at which point it crossed the x-axis uh, when f of x is equal to zero, and make that a limit, do two integrals, and then one of those integrals is going to give you a negative area, which you turn into a positive. But just choosing these two limits of 1 and negative 3 is incorrect, won't give you the right area. Question number two, a company operating a coal mine is concerned about the mine running out of coal. It is estimated that 2.5 million tonnes of coal are left in the mine. The company wishes to mine all of this coal in the next 20 years. In order to mine the coal in a regulated manner, the company models the amount of coal to be mined in the coming years by this formula. So we've got M sub R is equal to 10 over R squared plus 8R plus 15, where M R is the amount of coal in millions of tonnes, so not just tonnes, millions of tonnes, mined in year R, with the first year being year 1. Part A shows that according to the model, the total amount of coal mined in millions of tonnes mined in the first n years is given by this. Total, guess t, t sub n, is equal to 9n squared plus 41n all over k times by n plus 4 times by n plus 5, where k is a constant to be determined. Okay, so we want to find the sum of all of these mrs for the first n years, which means finding the sum of 10 over r squared plus 8r plus 15 from r equals 1 to n. Now this is not something I can use the sum of series on because um, all of those squares and things are at the bottom it's like 10 over that so I'm going to use the method of differences. So to do that I need to take this here and do partial fractions on it first before I can even start about the doing the method of differences. So I've got 10 over. Now let's factorize the bottom and that will be 
Uh, actually, let me write the whole thing out. R squared plus 8R plus 15, so you can see where it's coming from, is equal to 10 over. Now, this factorizes into R plus 5, R plus 3. And then I can make this equivalent to A over R plus 5 plus B over R plus 3. So um, if I make the denominators the same, I'll get 10 is equal to A times by R plus 3 plus B times by R plus 5. So let's start by making R equal to negative 3. So when R is equal to negative 3, I will get 10 is equal to 2B. That means b is 5 and then if I let r equal to negative 5 then this bit disappears I will get 10 is equal to negative 2a which means that a is equal to negative 5 so I can take my sum so therefore my sum from r equals 1 to n can be written in this form 5 over r plus 3 so i'm putting the positive one first because that was 5 minus 5 over r plus 5 so here i can begin to see where my method of differences is going to come from so I'll start to write out all of the first terms here. So 5 over, replace r with 1, 4, replace r with 2, then 5 over 5, 5 over 6, so on. And then if I go all the way to the end, the last term is going to be 5 over n plus 3, the term before that, uh, 5 over n plus 2. And then I want to subtract all of the terms, but now with uh, this, so 5 over r plus 5 which would be 5 over 6 uh, and then 5 over 7 when r is 2 5 over 8 plus let's write the last couple of terms out so i'll have 5 over uh, n plus and that will be 4 plus 5 over n plus 5 now let's see which terms cancel out and what the cancelling pattern is. So these two cancel out. That's going to cancel out with something there. That's going to cancel out. Okay, and then these two are going to cancel out as well. Whoops, so that line quite won't quite be there. Um, the 5 over n plus 3 is going to cancel out with the term just in front of the 5 over n plus 4. That will cancel out with that. Another clue is that whenever you do these types of things, however many terms you have at the beginning that are left over, you should have the same number of terms at the end left over. So I've got two at the beginning and two at the end. So putting this all together, we can say but by using the method of differences, the original sum up here, the 10 over r squared plus 8r plus 15, is equal to these first two terms added together 5 over 4 plus 5 over 5 minus these last two terms here and I guess the next steps are going to be trying to simplify all of this so this next bit of work in here puts these two fractions together 9 over 4 minus then I've put these two fractions uh, together to get this now I'm going to clear a bit of space at the top to finish off the working for this so um, putting them all over the same denominator will give us this expression here. The next step is just going to be to multiply out all the brackets. So let's have a look at what we get at the top here. So we will get 9n squared, then we'll get 9n times uh, 9, so that's 81n, and then 4 times 5, 20, times by 9 is 180, then minus 20n, then minus 100, then minus another 20n, and then minus 80. And that's all over this denominator of 4n plus 4n plus 5. I guess what we can do now is simplify the top. 
and if we do that we'll get 9n squared and we've got 81n minus 20n that's 61 minus another 20 is 41n and then we've got that should be 180 there not 18 so 180 uh, minus oops another zero missing there minus um, 100 um, so that's 80 minus another 80 oh that's just zero and then that's all over 4 n plus 4 n plus 5 now if I have a look that's the form that they wanted it in over here so what we've got is k equal to 4 Part B. Explain why, according to this model, the mine will never run out of coal. Well, what we want to do is to see what happens as n approaches infinity with this total um, amount of coal that's been mined. Now, I know this may not necessarily be mathematically correct, but what I like to do is try and get an idea as replacing n with infinity in uh, this total um, amount of coal and what I've done here is just expand these brackets um, and that would give me like four four let's write it down so it give me four n squared plus 36 n plus uh, 480 yeah so that's where these numbers the four the 36 and the 80 have come from so as I said, not really mathematically correct, but it helps me understand. So infinity trumps numbers, so we can forget about the 80. Infinity in squared trumps infinity, it's bigger. Okay, so we can forget about that. And you can say in a way that the infinity squares cancel out. So we're just left with 9 over 4. So as n approaches infinity, basically the limit as uh, n approaches infinity of t n, that's just going to be 9 over 4 that is equal to what, 2 and a quarter 2.25 okay now remember this is millions of tons of coal and how much uh, coal was there did we say there was in total 2.5 million tons so we can just conclude that since um, 2.25 is less than 2.5 the mine will not run out of coal right let's move on to part c and it says here the company decides to mine an extra fixed amount each year so that all the coal will be mined in exactly 20 years all of the coal will be mined in exactly 20 years refine the model MR so that 2.5 million tons of coal will be exhausted in exactly 20 years of mining so what we want is that for the total for 20 to do to be 2.5 let's see what it actually is so with the current model um, current is that E or a I think it's e current model the total in 20 years well we can just sub in 20 into this or into this um, like my expanded form and see what we get so that'd be 9 times 20 squared plus 41 times 20 over 4 times by 20 plus 4 times by 20 plus 5 see what we get with that and that's 221 over 120 right what is that as a decimal 221 divided by 120 or press the SD button and I get 1.8416 recurring now that's this number here is what is actually going to be mined I want 2.5 million tons to be actually mined what's the difference so if I do 2.5 and I take away the 221 over 120 
that leaves me with 79 over 120 million tons of coal to be mined over 20 years over 20 years so basically each year I want a basically a 20th of that so that would be 79 over 120 divided by 20 um, that is 79 over 2400 so I want that extra amount to be mined every year so what I can do is take the amount that's been mined every year and then just add this to it so my new model is going to be MR M sub R is equal to um, the 10 over so the original model R squared plus AR plus 15 plus this extra top up amount of coal which are will then bring it up to the 2.5 million tons of coal to be mined question three we've got a matrix p here 3347 and it represents a linear transformation t of the plane part a describe the invariant points of the transformation t so invariant points are going to be those points which uh, don't change position so i can call a general point x y and basically i want to find out when those points end up in the same place and that's represented by using um, x y on both sides here so if you multiply this out the matrices we get 3x plus 3y is equal to x and then we get 4x plus 7y is equal to y the top equation here will give me 2x is equal to negative 3y and the bottom one gives me 4x is equal to negative 6y now these equations are just linear multiples of each other they represent the same uh, equation and rearranging for y the equation it gives me is y is equal to so divide both sides by negative 3 on this one up here will be negative 2 thirds x and basically what that means is that all the points that lay on this line are invariant points so there's not just a single point there's a whole line of points which are invariant invariant so i'll just conclude that all the points on the line y equals negative two-thirds x or all of the points which satisfy this equation um, are invariant so not just one set of points a whole set of points on a line are invariant part b describe the invariant lines of the transformation t now we can describe invariant lines like this so that a line this is basically uh, y equals mx plus c so we'll write the y as mx plus c not just y because we want a line not just a single point um, is an equivalent line um, and also y equals mx plus c but not the same x a different x over here so i use the capital letter x so when we're trying to find invariant lines this is the format that we would use so multiplying out the matrix you'll get 3x plus 3mx plus c is equal to x and then 4x plus 7mx plus c is equal to mx plus c now what i'll do i'll substitute this equation for x in the second one so i'm basically taking all of this here and putting it where the x is here because it's equal to x which is what i've got here now i'm going to expand bracket simplify it so here all the brackets have been expanded so the next step all i've done is collect all together all the x terms which i've underlined in green so we've got a 4x so the x is there 
we've got 7mx or 7m there minus a 3m to make 4m and then bring this across a 3m squared x and then collect together all the c terms so i've got 7c minus c 6c and then bring this across uh, so my uh, minus 3m c and set that all equal to zero next step is to factorize both sets of brackets so this first set of brackets here becomes 2 minus m 2 plus 3m and then also factorize out a 3 here and you get 2 minus m and notice that we have um, a common factor from both of these terms here then because this is a common factor next step here I've just taken that outside of the brackets that 2 minus m common factor so from the first bracket here that means that 2 minus m equals 0 m equals 2 and for this second bracket here now the only way this bracket is going to equal 0 is if 3c is equal to 0 which means that c is 0 and 2m or oh sorry 2 plus 3m is equal to 0 and that will give m is equal to negative 2 thirds so the two lines we're going to get from the m equals 2 we'll get y is equal to 2x plus c so this is an invariant line now the reason we can put plus c on the end is because when we solve this and found m equals 2 it doesn't matter what the value of c is it doesn't matter what you've got for c over here this is going to make it equal to zero so the line 2x plus any value of c is invariant then for the second one well c does need to be zero so y equal to negative 2 third x with a value of c equal to zero is also an invariant and these are both invariant lines and uh, you'll notice that this is the same invariant line as all the points which were invariant here in the first one so if all the points on this line are invariant the actual line itself is invariant so that confirms what we got in part a so two lines which are invariant y equals 2x plus c and y equals negative 2 third x is invariant and then for part a is all the points on the line negative 2 third x which are invariant question 4 part a using the identity z times its conjugate is equal to the modulus of z squared or otherwise so we don't have to use this there may be another way of doing it show that if w is any root of unity then the modulus of w minus 2 squared is equal to 5 minus 2 times w plus its conjugate so before we get started just a couple of things to write down to remind you of that the modulus of any uh, root of unity is one the size of any root of unity is one and the sum of the roots of unity is zero so with the identity written up here the first thing i'm going to say is to let z equal w minus 2 so that means i can take what's written on this side here on the left and i'm going to see if i can get what's written on the right by starting by using w minus 2 squared so i'm replacing z with, with w minus 2 so i'm doing it over here and that's going to equal z which is now w minus 2 times by its conjugate now we need to think carefully about where we put the conjugate symbol now if i put the conjugate symbol here and put w minus 2 i'm going to get stuck i'm not going to be able to proceed I'm not using the method i'm using anyway you may know in a different way however it's going to be the w part that turns this into its conjugate so I've put W star remember it's the imaginary part that changes sign uh, 2 is real so putting a conjugate on outside the bracket here uh, doesn't really work it just needs to be next to the W because the imaginary parts in here somewhere that's going to turn it into the conjugate of W not the minus 2 so we don't need to apply the minus 2 to the um, conjugate part 
the next step all I'm doing is expanding the brackets here so WW conjugate minus 2W minus 2W conjugate plus 4 in the next step I'm just going to use the identity here so W times its conjugate like Z times its conjugate is just Z modulus of Z squared so it's a modulus of Z squared or W squared I've moved a 4 over here and then I factorized out the negative 2 from these two terms that's because I'm keeping an eye on what I've got here I want to get to this now I'm almost there now what have we got here w is a root of unity and a modulus which is what we've got of any root of unity is one so the size the modulus of w is one and here we've got one squared so that's just one plus four minus two w plus its conjugate last step is just to put the one and the four together to get five minus two w plus its conjugate so we've got the result as required Let's move on to the next part. Figure one shows a regular heptagon, A1 to A7. So here's the regular heptagon here, seven sides, whose vertices all lie on a unit circle with the center at the origin here and A1 at one zero. So the coordinate of this point here is one zero. The point X lies on the same plane as the heptagon and has coordinates two zero. So this coordinate here is two, zero so it's like guess one unit away from a using the result given in part a what we need to do is to find the sum of i from 1 to 7 of x at a sub i squared now this bit that's in the bracket here represents the distance from x to each vertice from the distance from x to a from x to a to x to a3 and so on or you could think of them like vectors these are vectors between these two points and what we want are these distances here maybe it might not be helpful to describe them as vectors but basically these distances here these dotted lines and we want to work out what all of those distances are find the sum of them and then square them now those distances are represented by what we've got here these are distances squared the distances between this point 2 and W which are these roots of unity these are roots of unity here so these are all like W's so what we've got here can actually be rewritten as this the modulus the distance the size between W and this point 2 which is X squared so we're basically replacing this statement here with this statement they mean the same thing the distances between these points X is like the 2 and W is like all the a1 a2 a3 and so on these roots of unity and how do I know that a1 to a7 are roots of unity couple of clues it says that all of these vertices lie on the unit circle so they're one point or a distance of one from the origin and the point a one is at this point one zero so we definitely know it's a distance one so all of these points are all a distance of one from the origin and they're also the vertices of a regular heptagon which means that they're roots of unity where the first root is at one zero the first root of unity would be one and then these others represent the other roots of unity now i've added a little i here i should put a little i here because we're going from w1 to w7 uh, what i can do in the next step now is take the right hand side of this identity and just swap it out for the w uh, i minus two and then put the other side of the identity which we proved in part a it does say use the result in part a which is what we're doing now now we need to see what we can do to simplify this now i've got the sum of the um, roots of unity and the sum of the conjugate roots of unity now the sum of the roots and conjugate roots of unity is still zero so why is that so i've written it over here as well this may be a useful result uh, to use 
When we find, the, as I said, the sum of the roots of unity, they all sum to zero. So if I found the conjugates of all of the roots of unity, then the real part of those uh, conjugates is unchanged. That will still add up to zero. The imaginary part of the roots of zero, all that happens is they change from positive to negative. Their sum will still be zero. So that's what allows us to actually write here for this part this is that this is actually equal to zero so this sum we've got here is just equal to the sum of the fives since this part here the sum of w plus its conjugates these roots of unity is equal to zero so we're only left with this so that means to work this out all we do is seven times five because we've got five plus five plus five plus five seven times that just leaves us with a total of 35. So that is our final answer, which we'll highlight. Question 5. We've been given that y is equal to arctan shine x. So let's just highlight that here. And what we need to do is to show that the third derivative is equal to the first derivative minus two times the first derivative cubed. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is to write down uh, two results which we're going to use for arctan x and shine x. And I'll be using the chain rule to differentiate this. You could use substitution and make q equal to shine x if you want to. I just say, right, I'm going to uh, differentiate the outside and then multiply by the inside differentiated. Right, so if I differentiate, differentiate the outside, which is arctan, that becomes 1 over 1 plus x squared, which is like inside squared, and the inside is shine x. So it's going to be shine squared x. So that's the outside differentiated. And then I multiply by the inside differentiated and shine is going to become cosh so that become cosh x now i do want to simplify this as much as possible because i've got, got to differentiate this another couple of times the one plus shine x we can use the identity to write that as cosh x so we now have cosh x over cosh squared x simplifying that even further then we just get one over cosh x which is equal to check x. Now, I do need to differentiate again. Now, there is a result for differentiating check x, but you may not necessarily know that result. I've put it here that when you differentiate check x, you get a negative check x tanch x. So if you don't know the result, it's not in the formula book, um, then I'm going to do this as if it were written as cosh uh, x to the power negative 1 and just use the chain rule. So if I use the chain rule on that, assuming I don't know the results, that would be negative cosh x to the power of negative 2 times by the inside differentiated, which is going to be shine. Now this actually gives the same result as what we've been given here. So you can write this expression here as negative shine uh, over cosh squared that's the same as 1 over cosh to shine over cosh and that is gives us the negative uh, check x tan x okay so now my next step is to attempt to differentiate this a third time now I've color coded it because I'm going to use the product rule so this red part here is on my u this bit here the tan that I've underlined in green is my v so I've got u times by uh, v dash or du dx or du d, dv dx sorry okay so we're using this result here differentiate tanch which is shek squared and then this becomes my v here tanch times by negative shek x differentiated and we've got that result because we differentiated shek didn't we and get this result or you may remember this result here now because we're differentiating negative shek this will become a positive. So we've got check x tanch x. And then here, all I've done is just multiply the brackets. So the second set of brackets, tan squared 
uh, tanch squared sh uh, shek squared and then minus here shek cubed x now the next step is to try and show that this third derivative that i've got here is equal to the first derivative so that's the shek x there be good if i highlighted it just to make it a little bit easier to see so um yeah my first derivative there okay so these are the bits i'm going to be using now so my third derivative can i show that it's equal to the first derivative minus two lots of the first derivative cube in other words i want to try and get this to look like shek minus two shek cubed so what i'm going to do is use our identity to replace the tanch squared x with one minus shek squared x the reason being what i'm trying to get to has only got dy dx's in it so it's only got shek in it so i want to get rid of the tanch the next step is to multiply out the brackets and that leaves me with shek x minus two lots of shek cubed x and we know from up here that dy dx is um, shek x so since dy dx is equal to shek x then my expression up here becomes dy dx minus two lots of dy dx or shek x cubed so we get the result as required part b hence find the fifth derivative in terms of dy dx d squared y over dx squared and d cubed y over dx cubed now we'll go on to the fourth derivative and basically we're just going to differentiate what's on the right hand side over here and you just need to think of dy dx like a like a term that we're differentiating so when you differentiate dy dx again you get d squared y over dx squared so think of it just like a term like rx or something then um, here i'm going to use the chain rule so i differentiate the outside so that'll become minus six and then remember the bracket doesn't change to the power two and then i multiply by the inside differentiated well if you differentiate dy dx just like we did with the first term it becomes d squared y over dx squared so i move on to the fifth derivative so i differentiate this so it becomes d cubed y over dx cubed and then to differentiate this part i'm going to use the chain rule where i think of this part here as my u and this part here as my v so as i said using the product rule so this part here remains unchanged while i differentiate this so that's going to just become d cubed y over dx cubed and then the other part of product rule we're going to differentiate this so that will become 12 uh, power becomes 1 inside doesn't change and then we multiply by that differentiated which is d squared y over dx squared and then times by like the v part which remains unchanged okay and then the last step here all i've done is just tidy up a bit so that term remains unchanged and i've got minus six lots of this and then minus 12 lots and basically here i've got something times itself so i can write d squared y over dx squared all squared and moving on to part c find the mcluhan series for y in ascending powers of x up to and including the term in x to the power five so to do this part of the question we're going to need the mcluhan expansion so i've written the first few terms out here and the results from our previous uh, derivative so dy dx the second derivative here the third derivative we've got here the fourth is here and the fifth one is this uh, longer one down here so if I say that I'm going to let f of x equal arctan shine x, the function that we started with here, to call it a function, then if I put 0 into this, f of 0 is 0. Then if I work at f dash of 0, in other words, if I put 0 into this, I'd have to do 1 over cosh 0. Cosh 0 is 1, so um, f of 0 is equal to 1. 
Now, when I put zero into this, I'll get negative one here, but tanh zero is zero. So that means that the second derivative of zero is equal to zero. Now, when I get to the third derivative, I can use my previous answers to help me because basically it's the first derivative at zero minus two times that first derivative cubed. So the result of the first derivative was one. So that's one minus two times by uh, one cubed, which just leaves you with negative one. Now, when we get to the fourth one, it's the second derivative, which is zero minus six times the first derivative squared. So that's one squared times by the second derivative, which is zero. So all of that makes zero. And then we're on to the last one, the fifth derivative at zero. And then for the fifth derivative, it's going to be the third derivative at zero, which is negative one, minus six times by the first derivative, one squared, times by the third derivative, which is negative one, minus 12 times by first derivative, one, times by the second derivative, zero squared. And that leaves you with a final answer of five. OK, so now what we can do is substitute the highlighted values into Mercurian expansion. Well, the first term is just going to be zero. The coefficient of the second term is going to be one. So we have x. The x squared term, well, um, that's going to also be zero because its coefficient is zero. If we move on to the next one, that will be x cubed over three factorial which has a coefficient of negative one. So that would be minus x cubed over three factorial, which is six, or we could leave it as uh, three factorial. The fourth term, which will be x to the power four over four factorial, well, that has a coefficient of zero, so there's no term there. Then we move on to the last one. That will be um, plus five, so that has a coefficient of five, and that's times by x to the power 5 over 5 factorial, which is 120. And then we can just simplify that last fraction. So we've got x minus uh, x cubed over 6. And then the 5 over 120, that's basically like x to the power 5 over 24 plus dot, dot, dot. So here we go. There's our... McLaurin expansion ups to the x to the power 5 term for this arctan of shine x. Question 6. A damped spring is part of a car suspension system. In test for the system, a mass is attached to the damped spring and is made to move upwards in a vertical line. The motion of the system is modelled by the differential equation d squared x over dt squared plus 6 dx dt plus 9x is equal to 2e to the power of negative 3t, where x is the vertical displacement of the mass above its equilibrium position and t is the time in seconds after motion begins. In one particular test, the mass is moved to a position 20 centimetres above its equilibrium position and is given an initial velocity of 1 metres per second upwards. For this test, use the model 2 part a find an equation for x in terms of t. So to do this, we need to start by finding the complementary function. I'll just put cf. And we do that by starting by writing the auxiliary equation, which is m squared plus 6m plus 9 is equal to 0. Now, this quadratic factorizes to m plus 3 all squared, um, and that's equal to zero. That gives us one repeated real root, which I'll call alpha, which is equal to negative three. So that will give us a general solution for this complementary function of a plus bt times it by e to the power of negative three. Next part is now to move on to find the particular integral. Now to find a particular integral, we need to look at the form that we have here on the at right hand side of this second order non-homogeneous differential equation. So we might say, right, first I'm going to try x equal to lambda e to the minus 3t. In other words, a constant times by e to the negative 3t. However, that appears in the complementary function. A constant, if I multiply the brackets, a constant a times by e to the negative 3t. So what we need to do 
we need to take what we're going to try and multiply it by t. So that will now give us lambda t e to the minus 3t. However, this also appears in a complementary function. Again, multiplying the brackets, I will get a constant t e to the negative 3t, which is what I've got here. So I need to multiply it by t again. And if I do that, what I'll actually need to try is lambda t squared e to the minus 3t. Now we need to find dx dt, so we differentiate this using the product rule. So that it will give me negative 3 lambda t squared e to the negative t. So I've left this part alone here, which I'm calling uh, u. Here's my u, and this part underlined in red, that's my v. So here I have u v dash. So this differentiate gives you the minus 3. And then for the second bit, I differentiate the first part, so I get 2 lambda t and then leave this part alone here. Now what I'm going to do is simplify it or just factorize it. It'll just make it easier to differentiate again. So I can take out a lambda, a t, an e to minus 3t as a common factor of both of these terms. And then I'll have two lots of this and then minus 3t lots of what I've got outside the brackets. Now we can take what we've got here, use the product rule to differentiate it. I'm not going to read it all out. Um, but basically, this is my u part, lambda t to the power e to the minus 3t, and my 2 minus 3t is my v part. So I will get this expression along here. If I expand out the second set of brackets, I'll get this long expression here. And then what I've done at the end here is just to factor out the lambda e to the minus 3t, because that's in every term. And then in the brackets, I'll get 2 minus 12t plus 9t squared. Now I take my second differential, my first differential, let's just highlight that uh, here, and my value for x, which is here. And then those three I substitute into the differential equation. So I've got one of the second differential here, plus six lots of the first differential here, plus nine lots of x, which is here. That's going to be equal to 2e to the minus 3t. If I equate coefficients, then on the left-hand side, there are two lambda e to the minus 3t terms. And that actually comes just from here, multiplying that out. All the other terms have got t's in them. And that's going to equal the 2e to the minus 3t. So therefore, lambda is equal to 1. That means that our particular integral is just t squared e to the minus 3t. Remember, we found this value of lambda up here to be 1. So now we've got a general solution, which is the uh, complementary function plus the particular integral. So that's a plus bt all to the power uh, e to the minus 3t. So that's this part plus our pi, which is t squared times e to the minus 3t. Right, so now moving on to the particular solution. So that's going to allow us to find the value of these arbitrary constants. And we do that by looking at the information in the question. Now, it says here that we have an initial position of 20 centimetres uh, above its equilibrium. So what that tells us is when t is equal to zero, the displacement x is equal to 20. And then it says here that at that same time, it had initial velocity. Now, I believe this is a printing error here. This should actually say 100 meters per second upwards. And that's the value we're going to use to work it out. If you use one, then it doesn't match with the actual working that the exam board have got for this particular question. So we're going to use 100 meters per second as this initial velocity. So that tells me the initial velocity, which we can write as x dot, or we can write as dx dt is equal to 100. Now what we'll do is we'll substitute the 20 and the t equals to 0 into here. So we'll have 20 is equal to, now there's no point writing all of this out, because this term will become 0, so that's gone. Let's just cross that out. Uh, this term will become 1. This term will go because of the t is equal to 0. So we're basically left with 20 is equal to a, so a is 20. Now, we 
now it needs to use this here, differentiate it to find dx dt, and then we can put in t equals 0 and dx dt equal to 100 to find the value of the other arbitrary constant b. Now we differentiate, and this is what we get for dx dt here, and now we're going to sub in the dx dt is 100 and the value of t equal to 0. So again, we don't need to write all of this out. Let's think about what disappears and what becomes 1. So anything with, that's multiplied by t is just going to become 0, so we can get forget about those. So I've crossed out everything that's become 0. That leaves us with 100 is equal to just negative 3a plus b. They're the only terms that are left. You can see they're not crossed out. So b is going to be 100 plus 3 times 20 because we've worked out a. So b is 160. So now we can plug in the 20 and 120 into our general solution. So sorry, 20 and 160, plug it in here. So this is our particular solution. Now I can put all of these terms together. Uh, which is what I've done here. So even one of these is acceptable. So x is equal to e to the minus 3t times by 20 plus 160t plus t squared. That now is our equation for x in terms of t. Part b. Find to the nearest millimeter the maximum displacement of the mass from its equilibrium position. Now, first of all, at the maximum displacement, the velocity is zero, so dx dt or x dot is equal to zero. So we differentiate our uh, particular solution here to find dx dt, which I've got in this line. I set that equal to zero. Now, if I expand the brackets and refactorize it, I get this expression here, which means that either e to the negative 3t is equal to zero, which it can't be or this other part here, 100 minus 4, 7, 8t minus 3t squared is equal to 0. That's the bit we're interested in. Now, using my calculator, I get these two solutions. Now, obviously, it can't be the negative one. t is greater than 0, so we'll forget about that one. So it's got to be this t is equal to 0 0.20893 number. So this gives us the time at the maximum displacement we want to find the maximum displacement so we now take this value of t and put it back into our particular solution here and if we do that on our calculators we'll get something like 28.5705 and so on and it does say to the nearest a millimeter and because these units here are centimeters then 28.6 centimetres the is the value that we'd give. Moving on to part C. In this test, the time taken for the mass to return to its equilibrium position was measured as 2.86 seconds. State with justification whether or not this supports the model. Now, if we take this time of 2.86 seconds and use it to work out the displacement, so we just substitute it back into our a particular solution will get a value of 0 0.912415 and so on. Now what we would expect as an answer from this is because we're talking about back to its equilibrium position we're talking about a displacement of zero and we get like a value here which is fairly close to zero. So putting that down at equilibrium position x would equal zero from our model, we get a value of this 0 0.09. This is in centimetres. So this actually differs from the actual position by less than a millimetre. So I would say that this supports the, the model since like we've got such a small difference between what we'd expect zero and what we actually get from this model. Question seven. Figure two shows uh, a sketch of the cross section of a design for a child's spinning top. The top is formed by rotating the region bounded by the y axis, so that's going to be here. The curve C1 and the curve C2, so C1 is here, C2 is here. The line with equation x equals a half, so that's this line here, and the line with equation y equals 12, so that's the very top part of the spinning top. 
um, and it's rotated 360 degrees around the y-axis so we're rotating like this the curve c1 has this equation here so let's just highlight that and just put color around it green so this is c1 here and we've got limits for the value of uh, x and then the curve c2 is this curve here or this function here and again we've got limits for the value of x and what we need to do in part a is show that this integral here uh, integrate between limits of 8 and k gives us this value so let's work through that now although it might look quite complicated it's fairly straightforward because these values that i've highlighted here are constants so all we need to do basically is integrate it with respect to y so the y will become half um, and then 4k squared minus 1 y squared and then the second term will just become uh, 32k squared minus k times by y and then limits of 8 and k let's put those limits in so first of all putting the 8 in uh, 8 there 64 half of 64 is 32 so we'll have 32 times by what's in the brackets 4k squared minus 1 and then we'll put the 8 into here so we'll have minus 8 and then at 32k squared minus k right now we put the 0 in sorry the k in to here so we put k in here we'll have k squared over 2 so let's write that k squared over 2 4k squared minus 1 and then k into here so minus k times by 32k squared minus k now what i'm going to do now is to factorize um, each set of brackets so for the first bracket i can actually take out 4k squared minus 1 um, as a factor so i'm taking that factor out from let's highlight it from here and here let's put those terms together so sorry not from the first bracket from both sets of brackets so 4k squared minus 1 first bracket is going to be 32 and then minus k squared over 2 then i'm going to take out 32k squared minus k as a factor and that would need to be multiplied by k from the second bracket minus k minus k and then minus 8 now I need to keep an eye on what I need to try and get it to look like so this the rest of this is just algebraic manipulation now if I have a look I've got k minus 8 but here I've got 8 minus k I want this to match up the same so what I'm going to do is if I change that bracket to 8 minus k so it matches up that means I then change this plus sign here to a minus sign keeping it equivalent but now on the right lines to get to this now I'm going to take out this 8 minus k as a factor now I can do that because if I look at this bracket here that can actually be written as 8 minus k times by 4 plus a half k so if I put this bracket in 4k squared minus 1 and this 4 plus a half k it will give me this first set of terms and then I just need to subtract from that the 32 k squared minus k and that should all expand out to give me the same set of terms i've got here but i've now got this out as a factor the next step now is just to multiply all these brackets which i've done here and now simplify this as much as possible and then um, if i put that together i'll get 2k cubed minus 16k squared uh, and then plus a half k because i've got minus a half k plus k and then minus four and now if I take out half as a factor because that's what I want here so so far I've got the 8 minus k I'm going to take out the half as a factor so if I do that then inside the brackets I just need to take these numbers here and times them by 2 to make it balance so 4k cubed minus 32k squared plus k minus 8 and you can see that's exactly what we want so we've got the result as required
Hence find in part B the value of K that gives the maximum value for the volume of the spinning top. Now, to find the maximum volume, we first need to find an expression for the volume. And the volume's made up from three bits. And I'll try and do these in different colors. So um, finding this volume here, so that's like the C, the bit bounded by the C1 curve rotated around the Y axis. And then the bit for the C2 curve. So we'll have to use the correct limits to rotate that around the Y axis. And then lastly, we've got this bit up here, rotate that around the Y axis. That's just gonna be a cylinder. So we'll do those three parts separately. So the total volume is going to be that C1 rotated around the Y axis, C2 rotated around the Y axis, and then this cylinder at the top. So just a reminder, if we're do, working at a volume of revolution around the Y axis, that volume is pi times the integral of X squared integrated with respect to Y. So that should be dy at the end there. So starting with this one, the volume of this part here. Now my limits are gonna go from zero up to K. So I'm looking at the yellow part here. So zero to K and then we've got pi. Then I need the equation for C1, which is actually given in the previous part of the question. And it says that the equation for C1 is Y is equal to K to the power two thirds times by x to the power of third. Now what I need to do is to rearrange to make um, x the subject and I square that. So if we cube both sides of this, we'll get y cubed is equal to k times x. And then from there, we'll get x is equal to y cubed over k squared. So my x that goes here is gonna be y cubed over k squared. And that needs to be squared and integrated with respect to y. So if we square first, we'll now get y to the power 6 over k to the power 4. And if, if we integrate that, we'll get y to the power 7 over 7k to the 4. And we now need to substitute in the limit 0 and k. So that will be k to the power 7 when we put k in over 7k to the 4 minus 0 all times by pi. And then that simplifies to pi times by k cubed over seven. So we've now got the volume of the bottom part, the yellow part. So now we move on to the green one. That's going to be the volume of the C2 part. So again, it's gonna be pi times the integral between uh, the bottom part here, which is k, and it goes up to eight. And we need to take the equation of C2, and again, like we did for the first part, make X the subject. All right, so here was the equation for C2 given earlier in the question. Rearrange it to make X squared the subject, and we get this expression here. Now this bottom part is a constant, so when I write out with the integral, I'm gonna move it to the other side of the integration sign along with the pi. So what I'm going to get is pi over, and if I expand the negatives, I will get 4k minus 32. So all of that, bring any constants over to the other side. And again, limits of k and eight. And then as I begin to write it out, 4k squared minus one y, okay, which is that bit. Now I'm keeping an eye on what I did on part eight. If I look, I can see, well actually look, this first part's the same. And actually, if I write it as minus and the same form as part A, it's the same thing, isn't it? By writing it like this. So using that result, I've got my constant over here, pi over 4k minus 32 times by the result of this integral, which is this, the half 8 minus k times by 4k cubed minus 32k squared plus k minus eight. Now I can cancel down the eight minus k and the four k minus 32 to leave with negative pi over eight 
leaving the remainder here. So now what I've got is a nice simplified expression for the volume part of uh, C2. So I've got to color code it. So that's the one that was in green. Now for the cylinder part, so formula pi r squared h, so pi times by the radius of the cylinder, so that's this width here, so that's just going to be a half because the x coordinates are half, so times a half squared, and then times that by the height of the cylinder, well it's going from 8 to 12, so that has a height of 4, so we'll times by 4, and all of that just leaves us with pi. And colour coding it with this colour here for the, the other volume. Normally I use orange to show that I've got a final answer, but in this case it's just showing that it's the cylinder part. Now if we put those three parts together, we get pi k cubed over 7 for the yellow part. Then we get minus pi over 8, and then this polynomial in here is the green part, plus pi. Now you may not necessarily be happy with having a minus there. Um, it will add up to be positive, but just what I'm going to do is to flip that to a positive sign, which just means reversing the signs of all of the terms I've got in the bracket, which is what I've done there. Now, this question is all about finding the maximum volume. Now, we're going to find the maximum volume when we differentiate the volume with respect to k, because this is now an expression in terms of k, and when that equals zero. So differentiating gives us 3 pi k squared over 7, differentiating that term. And then inside this polynomial becomes negative uh, 12 k squared plus 64 k minus 1. We set that equal to 0. So if I take this and I divide everything by pi, divide both sides by pi, and times both sides by 56, I'll get 24 k squared plus 7, and in brackets, uh, minus 12 k squared plus 64 k minus 1 is equal to 0. And then if I expand the brackets here and simplify, I'll end up with this quadratic 60k squared minus 448k plus 7 is equal to 0. Solving on my calculator, I get these two solutions here. k is 7.45100, so on, or k is 0 0.01565. But early in the question, we're given this condition about k. k is greater than x, which is greater than a half. So k is greater than a half, so we can forget this value here. So the value of k that gives the maximum volume for the spinning top to three significant figures is 7.45. Moving on to part C, what we need to do is to find the maximum volume of the spinning top. OK, so basically all we need to do is to take this value of k that we worked out in part B and put it into the volume formula. And the volume formula that we worked out from before in part B was pi k cubed over 7 plus pi over 8 times by negative 4k cubed plus 32k squared minus k minus 8. Now if we do that and put that on our calculator, we will get a value of v equal to 236.88381 and so on. Okay, so I use the exact value here to do that. But really, the rounded value to three significant figures is going to be fine. And we'll give our volume to three significant figures. And that will give us 237 centimeters cubed to 3SF. And we'll just highlight that answer. And that means that this core two paper is now finished.